What actually went wrong in the circuit when you look at it, they thought that the initial stock of debt limited the flow of income. That just doesn't pos- isn't true. It's, it's, a, it's a typical conspiracy theorist type explanation for why debt rises, that you, get, you borrow the money, but you don't borrow the interest to pay the money, therefore you've got to pay, you borrow 100, you've got to pay back 103, you can't do it, so the debt, it's bullshit. It is simply wrong. Okay? And unfortunately, that is what turns up in circuitous thinking, not because they believe something as simplistic as that, but because the period analysis led them into that uh, mistake of, of identifying stocks and flows as identical, which they're not. Now, Keynes got it much more uh, accurately understood. He said he argued that a fixed stock of money could finance an indefinite flow of income. And he was right. He said you only need a rising amount of money if demand is growing. There's no need for an increasing stock of money unless demand and output is growing. And, and he was clearly right and clearly wrong, but the major stuff that the circuit had to say was still important. Money is a token. The important thing about money is that it's not backed by anything other than your trust in the, in the agent who, who's promised to pay you're exchanging for, in return for goods. Um, and the three-sided exchange and so on. So I'll get up to Keynes eventually, but I want to just finish a bit more on the triangular way that circuitous look at monetary system. And again, this is a great insight. So with the first model, is simply having an entire bank- banking sector. You're not breaking it down into individual banks. But when you do break it down into individual banks, then you have the possibility that the agent who's paying the money uh, maybe depositing the money uh, in the uh, trying to deposit the account of the money in the account of another agent who banks with a different bank. So you have effectively Bank A has a debt to Bank B in that situation. So each bank has to have reserves equivalent to a share of the credit market, effectively, or not 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 that high, but they need to have reserves so that they can do these transactions. And Brandon Graziani said, how do they do those? How do the banks themselves transfer the money when they're forced to do so by? a sale, a purchase and sale arrangement between two of their customers, they've got to have a central bank as a clearinghouse. So that's your next triangle. So you have a, the, tri- the central bank sitting at the apex of the private banks, enabling transactions to occur when they span more than one bank. So the, tri- the triangle structure goes all the way. It's, it's it just as I like my circle and the sort of dog bone uh, way of representing Marx and dialectics, I think a triangular one makes plenty of sense uh, for the model, the model of money as well. And this is, again, a bit more detail on having a government sector. They say once the government sector is there, then the reserves are a debt of the commercial bank towards the central bank if there was no treasury. When you have a treasury as well, then the treasury can create the money. And then the money that's created is a debt of the government towards the central bank. So there's a range of possibilities there. And again, the same idea, you've got two for exchange and one for double entry bookkeeping in terms of the number of agents you need for any, any particular transaction. So it applies to circulation of reserves as well. You have two private banks to, to, to actually make a transfer. If, if you a shop, you, if you, you're a buyer with HSBC and the company you're buying, you're buying from banks with Lloyds, then you have to have a transfer of reserves as well as a transfer of deposits. Actually, you have to have a transfer of reserves to affect the transfer of deposits. And the central bank records the change using its own ledger. So you then have, uh, when you look at the, the idea of just an individual, so you see, like you say, an individual bank with a buyer and seller both bank with that bank, or you have just a banking sector and you're ignoring the, uh, the internal structure of the banking sector, then that's fine. To make the deposit transfer, no problem. Okay? But when you have a disaggregated view, then you need reserves for interbank settlement. So you have Bank A here, where the buyer happens to be, Bank B here, where the seller is. To make that deposit transfer, there has to be a transfer of reserves as well. Okay? So that's the role that reserves play. That's the technical role in a banking system.